It's a recurring theme throughout history. Human apathy, neglect, even cruelty toward animals. In fact, human beings are directly responsible for the extinction of thousands of species. The theme is so well known, George Orwell drew upon it in his 1945 bestseller, Animal Farm. There, the animals finally revolted against human abuse and oppression. But today, another force is at work too. The heroic efforts of dedicated scientists and veterinarians who aim to turn the corner on humanity's historic exploitation and debasement of the animal kingdom. Pioneering treatments are well underway in the newly emerging field of regenerative medicine, which aim to cure animal disease, ease suffering, enhance quality of life, even bring extinct animal species back to life. It's a new kind of animal farm, one with a pH, one where the best humans have to offer is now offered to the beasts of our planet. So what are we doing here? Are we stewards of the planet? Or are we bound to an unsustainable quest for progress and consumption? In words commonly attributed to Chief Seattle, what is man without the beasts? If all the beasts are gone, man would die from great loneliness of spirit. For whatever happens to the beasts soon happens to man. All things are connected. We consider them as beings, compassionately not just as pets or as toys, but we should consider them as beings of equal value on this planet. It is this interconnection that has scientists working for, not against, the animals who are in our homes and elsewhere, all with the help of cutting edge technologies. We're providing all kinds of new options for treating both our pets and zoo animals, animals and even animals in the wild. Regenerative medicine is the promise to heal tissues that have otherwise been irreparable. Now regenerative medicine also includes things like using gene therapy or using other types of therapy to reform or regenerate tissues. We use stem cells to actually regenerate and repair the tissue. Regenerative medicine is a field that overlaps with the stem cell biology field and the idea is that there are many diseases and injuries which will cause degeneration or loss of cells within a tissue. And the entire goal of regenerative medicine is to be able to harness stem cells or other cells in the body to convince those tissues to regenerate or rebuild or repopulate themselves. Stem cell therapy is one of the most important advances in veterinary medicine and human medicine that's come along in the last probably 20, 30 years. Using yourself to heal yourself. Everybody has heard the term stem cells um, and there's a definition for what a stem cell is. It's a cell that can regenerate itself, it makes more copies of itself, and it can give rise to some kind of adult tissue. There are stem cells that live in our bodies that do exactly that. Stem cells are cells which, when they divide to give rise to two daughter cells, one of them, on average, is still a stem cell, while the other one is going to make the tissue. The property of making one of yourself is called self-renewal. The only cells in the body that have self-renewal are stem cells. There are two, really two types of stem cells. So there are the pluripotent stem cells and then the adult stem cells. So we, we put them in those two categories. The pluripotent stem cells were originally the embryonic stem cells. And those have been very controversial over the years because they're made from fertilized eggs that would be thrown away in in vitro fertilization clinics. Is it real? Is it safe? How do you, how do you use this new medical tool? 
So we really, we were worried, and the perception at the beginning was embryonic stem cells. Oh, and those kill babies, or are you killing puppies? Or, you know, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But embryonic stem cells are now not used in regenerative medicine. It has since been discovered adult stem cells could be harvested from many parts of the body, processed, and injected back into the same patient. Typically, whether human or animal, stem cells are acquired from adults by harvesting and processing bone marrow, blood, or adipose tissue, which is fat, then acquiring the stem cells from those tissues. But in the animal kingdom, this is not without difficulty. So exotic animals, whether they're in the wild, uh, whether they're a rare and endangered species, or whether they're in a zoo or a collection, Wild animals do not do well on synthetic and traditional medications. Not only do they not do well, um, they don't tolerate them well. A lot of those have to be given every day. So I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I'd want to go out and pill the cheetahs every day and go out and be injecting a rhino every day. Um, they're very difficult to do. If you think about making a narrow exam to a 300 kilogram tiger, then the only thing he would like to do is to eat you in any given moment. The tiger was extremely arthrosic, you know, many, many joints had osteoarthrosis, and we treated him with the lipogem system. We have done liposuction, we isolated the lipogems material, and we injected in all his joints. And he got a lot better. He had no pain, he managed to walk. Lipogems is an FDA compliant device that's used to harvest and optimize adipose tissue for use in regenerative therapies. Dimmi quando. Adipose tissue contains a large number of naturally occurring stem cells. These cells are quiescent in our bodies, waiting to be activated by damaged tissue that provides a signal to begin the regenerative process. And even in the wild, on animals to get injuries, because there you only get one chance. If you could have the cells with you, take them out there, we keep them frozen, take them out and treat a cheetah, treat a jaguar, a snow leopard that has a particular injury or a problem in a neck that cells might work for, we could give them therapy and then not have to handle them again. I was inspired to create my own company and help pets. We help with animals like dogs and cats, but we also have the wonderful opportunity to work with exotic animals like Komodo dragons. Originally found on Komodo Island in Southeast Asia, Komodo dragons are the largest lizards in the world, weighing up to 200 pounds. Though they've been around for millions of years, they're now on the verge of extinction. This lucky Komodo dragon was successfully treated with her own stem cells. In the exotic animal kingdom, sometimes you don't have the drugs available to treat them. It's not like you have, oh, Advil for Komodo dragons. It doesn't exist. So what you do is come up with new solutions for the problems they have. The well, Komodo dragon may not seem like it's relevant when it comes to regenerative medicine, but the truth is that everything's interconnected. We are interconnected with all the other species on this planet. If we let them die, we will die. We will die. So we had the opportunity to work with many animals uh, and really see firsthand how stem cells were capable of helping them in problems that they didn't have any solutions before. Cutting edge treatments aren't just for exotic landlubbers like the Komodo dragon. Dolphins and sea lions are benefiting too. Both play a significant role in the U.S. Navy, serving as expert bomb detectors. But they're prone to the same injuries as their human military counterparts. 
Dolphins are highly social and are often regarded as one of Earth's most intelligent animals. The average lifespan for dolphins is about 15 years, but they've been known to live to age 40, the equivalent of about 100 years for humans. Sea lions are known for their intelligence, playfulness, and noisy barking. They typically live to about 20 years, but some are known to live to age 30. Like other servicemen and women, dolphins and sea lions eventually show signs of old age. This means upon retirement from active duty, they need care too. They even have an old folks home for dolphins when they retire from service. They live out their life in a beautiful little place where they can have, so they take good care of them. So actually, the U.S. Navy came to us, and for those of you that don't know, yes, dolphins and sea lions both have stem cells, just like the rest of mammals. Not a surprise, and we were able to take those out and use them to treat skin wounds, but also to characterize them and make some banks of cells to show, yes, you can really do that. Now they have a bank of dolphin stem cells so that when the dolphin, when there's an injured or a sick dolphin, they just call and say, oh my God, this dolphin needs stem cells, can you come over? And they thaw the stem cells out, culture them, and use them. From that little work with the Navy, the big zoos have contacted us and they have the same kind of problems. We started talking about stem cells at the Conservation Studies Program at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. And we thought that stem cells might be useful for treating animals. And in fact, that has proved to be useful for a lot of animals using like adult stem cells to help treat them. So when you think about dealing with these exotic species, you, you, might, you might guess there are some challenges. So I thought, okay, so a rhinoceros is just a big horse, right? Not that big a difference. Gigantic difference. Their skin is, you know, four inches thick. So I'm not going to take a little scalpel and open it up. So we had to develop techniques to put a cannula in and actually do a small liposuction in a rhinoceros so you could get enough fat out so you could create banks of cells and be able to treat them. These cutting-edge technologies that have helped so many wild animals actually have their roots in domestic animal cloning research. It all began in 1996 with Dr. Ian Wilmot's research at the Roslyn Institute in Scotland. It was there the first mammal was cloned. Dolly the sheep was an exact copy of her mother in every way. We use sheep for our research in developing this technique because there are many ways in which it would be useful to copy farm animals and we were very confident that the technique that works in sheep would also work, work effectively in cattle and that has of course proved to be the case. When Ian Wilmot made Dolly, the sheep, from a cell taking from the tissue of the sheep they took out its genetic information, all of the chromosomes, the nucleus, and put it into a sheep egg that had its own chromosome removed. That gave rise to that cell which Ian Wilmot implanted and gave rise to Dolly. That proved that a cell that's in the body could be reprogrammed back to an early stage and that it could even give rise to an organism. I think that we're very confident that the, this research will lead to new clinical treatments for some diseases which can't be effectively treated at the, at the present time. We would believe very strongly that it's important that research in this biological area should continue as imaginatively as possible. Perhaps the most imaginative line of research to benefit animals is the stem cell zoo. While zoos have come to be controversial for keeping animals captive outside their native habitat, some good things have come about, like education, conservation, and now, preservation. At the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, 
Scientists are saving tissues and cells to preserve the gene pool of endangered animals. The park now has over 10,000 samples preserved across a wide range of exotic species. They keep them in a liquid nitrogen freezer, very, very, very cold at the zoo behind locked doors. And in each one of those freezers are thousands of samples in tiny little vials like this big, not that big. And they each contain maybe a million cells from some animal, some individual animal. We now use induced pluripotent stem cells. So Shinya Yamanako got the Nobel Prize for developing these amazing cells. We now use the patient's skin. Add some factors that turn it back to uh, pluripotency, which means it can become any, any, any tissue, any organ. And then we have a cell line perfectly matched to that patient. When it was discovered skin cells could be turned into stem cells, that is, cells capable of becoming any cell in the body, biologists started thinking. If they could do this to cells kept in a frozen zoo, animals could be saved from extinction. The question is whether people should be, uh, in zoos should be saving uh, samples of all the animals they encounter and or animals that are, even animals that aren't endangered that might be in the future for various reasons. I mean, if you have a small population that only lives in zoos, then it's susceptible to um, a, 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 a disease or a genetic abnormality. So yes, they should be saving them. And there are efforts afoot in Africa to try to save samples from animals. Now, efforts are underway in Africa to save tissue samples of their wild animal population. It's not a trivial task. From sustaining a freezer in Africa and transporting liquid nitrogen to wild animal tissue acquisition, it's all a Herculean effort. It offers something really special in the zoo world. And so I think the area of exotics and keeping these cells for endangered species, um, I think is hugely important. And I think we'll, we'll end up building lots of banks of cells that could be used worldwide. And I will add, I think we have a moral obligation to do that because it's our fault that these animals are becoming extinct. In almost every case, it's, it's human intervention that causes the extinction. We ruin their environments, we kill them for their horns, we kill them so we can, we can sell some part of them. So I think we need to invest a lot of energy into trying to figure out how to save them, how to rescue them, so they don't become extinct. The northern white rhinos are getting some of that energy now as the perfect case study for saving the species based on their current predicament. They've been driven to extinction by killing them for their horns because their horns, which are made out of the same substance that your hair and fingernails are made out of, nothing special at all, is used in traditional medicines in uh, China and Vietnam. And so there's a market for these rhino horns and because of that, people have been poaching them out of existence. At the time Dr. Loring and her team started their project, there were just seven northern white rhinos left in the world, plus several others who had tissue samples removed. Those samples are now frozen in the stem cell zoo. There are now two of these animals alive. They are extinct. They are still walking around. They don't realize they're extinct, but they are extinct because those animals will not be able to reproduce. Now, these scientists are producing stem cells from frozen tissues in the stem cell zoo, and from those, creating sperm and eggs. They aim to bring the northern white rhinos back from extinction. We will be able to take sperm and eggs from different animals, put them together in a culture dish, in vitro fertilization, transplant those embryos to a surrogate mother. This is just like the human system works in fertility clinics all over the world. And we can essentially recover a species. The first successful human in vitro fertilization that was accomplished with the birth of Louise Brown in 1978 
has since been followed by over 3 million other IVF babies worldwide. If you apply this technology, these are not clones, by the way. These are new animals, just like IVF babies are not clones of their parents. They're the children of their parents. So these are the children of two rhinos that just happen to no longer be alive, or two of any, any species. And we can essentially recover a species. And we can recover them because there were cells left. And we're teaching people how to do this right now. So we can make induced pluripotent stem cells from them and maybe use the same methods we're developing. No other species needs to become extinct because we should be able to regenerate anything that we can use this technology for and rescue whatever species it is that is on the brink of extinction. On the brink of extinction. But there are limitations. Experts say this technology will not bring back the dinosaurs. So we can't recover animals that were extinct before people started keeping cells. Because we have to start with cells. We can't just start with DNA. This is not Jurassic Park. This is like a practical version of, of Jurassic Park. Like, if there had been somebody around to start freezing dinosaur skin cells, we could regenerate dinosaurs. But since there wasn't, we can't. The same fate is also true for Ice Age mammals as well, like mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, and woolly mammoths. You have to freeze them very slowly and in a special medium that keeps them alive. The cells that you get out of a woolly mammoth that have been, has been frozen in the tundra for, I don't know, 40,000 years, they're not alive anymore. But for living creatures, the science is not limited to those in the wild. Regenerative medicine is providing novel options for treating the animals with whom we live and play. People are passionate about their horses. They don't want to euthanize their horses. And it's not just because they're great racers, it's often because these horses have been long-term members of their family. And they make any attempt to try to save that horse. To summarize regenerative medicine, it's basically providing a biological boost to the normal healing process. The horse is an interesting candidate because from an evolutionary standpoint, they're very adept at healing with scar tissue. That was a survival mechanism. The problem is that scar tissue forms an impediment to the future athletic potential of the horse. With our racing horses, we have a lot where they had severe tendon issues. And we've had cases now where the horse was actually written off for insurance purposes, meaning expected to be euthanized and we were able to regrow the tendon or save the hoof of the horse. So here we have a horse that's presented that has a chronic knee injury. He's a rescue horse and we're going to see if we can give him better knee function through regenerative medicine. Due to an old injury, this horse patient has limited range of motion from scar tissue or fibrosis that has formed over the joint. So physically, he can't flex the knee any further than this. And that's due to the scar tissue here from the previous injury. So we're going to use regenerative laser therapy to try and relieve this scar tissue and fibrosis and this joint contracture as well as some intraarticular adipose derived stem cells. This equine patient is tranquilized while standing and a bit of adipose tissue or fat is harmlessly taken from his rear just below the skin. And so we'll do a local block in this area and then we'll make a very small skin incision right here and then do what's called a lipectomy, where we will surgically remove an area of adipose tissue from right in this area. 
Once we've surgically removed that fat, we will send it into the laboratory in Poway, California, vet stem. We then take that piece of fat and in about six hours, turn that into a cell product to actually extract the cells, get rid of the fat, get rid of the adipocytes, get rid of the connective tissue, and end up with a cell counted product in a syringe ready to inject. So then we send that back to the vet. So regenerative medicine could be considered any process that gives that biological boost to healing, but it can be separated into mechanical, such as regenerative laser therapy, versus biologic, which is taking tissues or blood from the horse, processing it, and putting it back into the horse. The beauty of our program lies in teamwork, and we have 18 disease teams working very, very closely together to help develop therapies for their patients. I think for me, being a horse person, what's really exciting to me is how sometimes when horses get a hairline fracture, they don't have to be put down. We can take the stem cells in like a stem cell super glue and uh, mend their bone instead of having to destroy that horse. And to me, that's the most, I mean, it, it just, you know, I love it. So in some cases, we will use the regenerative laser initially in the process to clean up the area to stimulate blood flow, stimulate oxygenation, stimulate lymphatic drainage of the tissue. It's almost like we're using the laser to clean the area and get the ground ready for the seeds of stem cells to provide a better physiologic environment for the stem cells to take hold and begin the physiologic healing process. So what's been developed to help the horses with athletic injuries, we're now bringing here to the medical center to help our human athletes and our human patients. So to me, it's so exciting when things like that can help um, animals and then be transitioned to help patients in our clinic. And we have so many of those stories. And I would love to tell them all, but <laughs> I'll leave it just with the bone. The dog, bred from wolves thousands of years ago, was the first animal species to be domesticated. During the span of this time, dogs have been selectively bred for various behaviors, sensory capabilities, and physical attributes. The influence dogs have had on humans has surely earned them the title, Man's Best Friend. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. I'd heard about cloning and I'd heard about stem cell therapy with horses, but I didn't know it about, my, about dogs. So I started doing research on it. I'd been doing research and it seemed almost miraculous, at least what you read, but you, you know, I've... I've been around the media so much of my life that I know better than to believe most of what I read. I love it when a client comes to me and they've been doing their research before coming in. What stem cell? How does it work? Is my pet a good candidate for it? Should I you know, try one company or another? What can I expect? That's probably one of the best ways of going. Arm yourself with reputable information. I have never been so comfortable and, and trusting with my son, my four-legged son, Copper. He's 12 going on 13. I don't expect him to go out and chase tennis balls anymore. And if it helps him, then so be it. Dogs and cats, family members to many, are also on the regenerative medicine receiving end with remarkable results. So many dogs have injuries. They can be young and active and overly aggressive and overly athletic and have just injured themselves or they can have degenerative joint disease that occurs through old age and erosion. And so there's so many dogs and cats that have that. Uh, it's not restricted to one breed, one type, one age. It's the whole field. It's the whole uh, gamut of young, old, small, large dogs and cats. Pet 
ailments have historically been treated with toxic medications or costly surgery. But concerns about safety, success and expense are driving the demand for a regenerative medicine for pets. In the past, we didn't have options for all the treatments we have nowadays. We've all heard about giving cortisone injections into a bad shoulder joint or knee. It helps for a period of time. We'd have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pills. That helps. There's acupuncture. It helps. But sometimes we need it more. Short-term benefits, even long-term harm like joint erosion, keep interest keen in the search for other answers. I was looking for an alternative to surgery for all these animals that are injured. So they have hip dysplasia, they have torn cruciates, they have uh, meniscus tears, all these things. And these are usually treated surgically. These stem cells are wonderful because they know what needs to be done in the body. They can regenerate tissue, they can decrease pain, they can also decrease uh, inflammation. So with all of that, it's increasing that quality of life. And that's what we want for our pets. You know, we all want a long time with our pets, but we want to make sure whatever length of time we have is going to be that best quality. Now you've got platelet-rich plasma that are actually repairing the damage that's in there, so it's better. Platelets have been used for 100 years. Just in recent years, we've really understood how to concentrate them, use them right, where to put them, what the dose should be. We're learning a lot more about platelets now, but that's a part of regenerative medicine. We're essentially taking blood from the body and re-injecting it after we filtered it down and centrifuged it back into the body. It's the healing factors and the growth factors that help the body regenerate. There's so many different things that you can do for arthritis. In the past, if a pet came in with osteoarthritis, a chronic debilitating pain that we just you know, were trying to get on top of, we could try injections of steroids. Well, we know steroids, long-term high dose, can cause diabetes, can cause depression of the immune system. It helps for a period of time, but it can actually damage the cartilage. It also gets absorbed body-wide, so it can have issues. And with stem cell therapy, here's a way of using your own body to heal itself. Surgery is not an option for an old dog that's got heart problems, that has liver problems, has kidney problems. You can't give the anesthetic. And then you've got the problem of stroke on the table, uh, anesthetic problems, all kinds of stuff. This is much safer. In osteoarthritis and orthopedics, we now have more than 10,000 patients. So I can tell somebody pretty quickly, if your dog has hip dysplasia and now has pain and arthritis, I know very closely what to expect. 70, 75% of those with a single injection will have substantial improvement. And it's gonna last for a year or more with a single injection. So I know that. I watched a, I watched a canine procedure and you know, this dog had osteoarthritis, really achy, couldn't move. And you know, after the procedure, you know, a few days later, the dog was bounding up the stairs like a, like a puppy. So this is a happy medium where we can treat medically older dogs that can't be operated on. So this is an alternative for, for us and for the dog and for the owners. The dogs are happy and the people are happy. Uh, I've had really nice response with what we've done. Everyone's been happy. I think he's glad that, I, that I've tried to fix it or that I've tried to help it. He's never left me and I've never leaving him. And it doesn't matter to me, it doesn't matter to me how much it costs. Don't care about the cost. And if it can help him for a couple more years, that's what I want to do. But it also comes down to the quality of life and it gets down to finance. Stem cell therapy is not the most inexpensive proposition, but sometimes it's the only thing we have left and it can do amazing things. Using the patient's own cells was easy and it's the safe first way to do this, but really we'd like to have it be lower cost and have it be ready at the clinic. We are a nation of people who want stuff now. 
So you come in with your dog and he's got a sore shoulder, you want him treated now. And so if the cells are in the freezer from a donor, FDA qualified, lot release, manufactured in an appropriate facility, you can have it for half the cost and you can have it now. So, taking a cue from wild animal research, domestic animals now have stem cell tissue banks too. Veterinarians and clinics have begun saving stem cells for future regenerative medicine treatment for our pets. One of the best things about this stem cell is that I didn't have to harvest it every year when I needed more. I could call the lab saying, hi, Nikki needs another treatment. They would go ahead because they had banked it in cold storage as such, like when you have uh, eggs that a woman will donate or sperm that's going to be kept in cold storage. It's cryobanked. They then go ahead and culture it. They got more for me, and I never ran out. It was wonderful. They always had enough that we could give more treatments. So we can treat dogs that come to our clinic with stem cells that were acquired from a completely different dog. In our bank of cells, we have cells of, of nearly all the animals that we came, we, we came across. But sometimes uh, you need cells for a certain kind of animal and you don't have this kind of animal like the, the, the cells of wolves. At that time, we didn't have any sample of, the, of wolf cells. So we just took you know, what we have as dog cells in our, in our cell bank and uh, we used them on the wolf, we injected it into the, on the wolf and that was a very nice story that many journals and also some television uh, channels spoke about. They told the story of how dogs stem cells saved the life of a wolf. Yes, we're at the beginning of a new day <laughs> with therapy. Yes, I think it's a, it's a major new, pro, new thing that's, that's going to be more and more popular. Once this technology becomes standardized, veterinarians around the world will have an off-the-shelf stem cell product to treat osteoarthritis in pets, among many other ailments. And when it comes to cats, there's also an emotional human connection. Though the cat's solitary nature strikes a contrast to the affable dog, they're no less loved by their human companions. Kitty Maya. Oh, Kitty Maya. Kitty Maya 17. You just through the years have got started to get frail and has kidney issues. She's still a very happy kitty. She's very happy. She doesn't show us that she's hurting, but you can tell. She's frail. A cat, when it doesn't feel good, sleeps. And a cat does feel good, what does it do? Sleep. They are very good at hiding their signs of illnesses. Number one cat killer as they get older, cancer. Number two, kidney disease. Now research is being done on using stem cell for kidney disease. And it's marvelous because you're using the cat's own cells to cure itself. Kitty Maya's kidneys are starting to fail. And she's got some kidney issues. She has bowel issues. She's you know, eating. She's eating, but she's somehow not absorbing the nutrients. I would say the most exciting research finding that we've found with stem cells to date have to do with how stem cells modulate the immune system. So, it's very possible with the use of stem cells, we can help mitigate the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease in the cat. This seems like it would be a better option. What is so wonderful is that more research is being done on some of these chronic diseases that cats get. So cats will get diseases that are very much kitty diseases, where the gingiva, the gums, become extremely red, irritated at the point these poor cats can't eat. It hurts so much. It's because it's an autoimmune disease and the body starts to recognize their teeth as being foreign. Oh, that's all we're going to get? Okay, thank you. In the veterinary world, we've discovered that stem cells heal cats with severe chronic oral inflammation. About 70% of our cats go into complete 
clinical remission. And these are cats that have had no other therapeutic option. They've failed every treatment. And so for us, stem cells are being used to change and reset the immune system. Even the most respected scientists are unable to predict the progress of regenerative medicine in 5, 10, or 20 years. What was unimaginable yesterday is happening today, all to the good fortune of the collective animal farm. In regenerative medicine, the future is now. I think the future of regenerative medicine is going to revolve around proper diagnosis and collection of data so that we can see the responses to the different treatments that we have employed, therefore better able to focus our future efforts in regenerative medicine. We started in horses, we moved to dogs in about 2007, and then shortly thereafter added cats. Now we've done exotic, 30 different exotic species for the big uh, institutional locations, helping them with their medical problems. Overall, we have more than, than 17,000 patients treated. And those are real patients treated with real stem cells for real diseases. We have now injected thousands of animals with stem cells for all sorts of different conditions. And our first tenant is above all do no harm. And stem cells have been shown to be safe over and over again in clinical trials for patients, for human patients and for veterinary patients. Now these are adult derived stem cells. And so we offer a safe solution that also is a viable solution for actually promoting cure and health in a way that hasn't been offered before with many other techniques. And we are done. I think one of the things that is so fabulous about medicine these days is that there is a real initiative called One World, One Health, One Medicine. And we're working on so many different species. We have to collaborate. We have to talk to our colleagues, especially those that are working in areas like zoo animal. So it's this wonderful collaborative philosophy that's going on now. So what we are very excited about is the use of naturally occurring diseases in pets that come to veterinary hospitals seeking for veterinary care to try new therapies exactly in the same format that you would try new drugs in human clinical trials. This is what is called translational medicine, okay? What we see that is working very well in dogs and doesn't harm them at all, I mean zero side effects that might work very well in human beings. And this is only one example. So we have the basic research across the hall in our building. Translational research goes on in this shared translational lab with a lot of teams working side by side on different therapies. We have a really neat thing going on uh, at the vet school where the animals are the patients. So these are client-owned animals coming in with cancers, with injuries, with enlarged hearts. With, with strokes, things that happen to their owners are also happening to them because they're eating the same diet, they're living in the same environment. And so we are doing a lot of clinical trials at the vet school that mimic what we hope to do in the humans and that can be also some evidence that the stem cells are safe in a large animal with an, with an intact immune system. I expect we will have significant therapies for many cancers and many genetic diseases through stem cell therapies and molecules or antibodies that were made, that were discovered because we could get out the stem cells. The new therapies that I am certain will come, and have already in part come from stem cells, is you transplant them once. And because they self-renew, it's a single treatment for life. That will change medicine. That will change the economics of health care. I see having the ability to use stem cells to treat just about any disease that our, our animals would have. Not only, not only our pets, but animals in zoos and wild animal parks. We should have species-specific cells for just about every indication. What I'm really hoping for stem cell research going forward is being able to reach on a shelf 
and grab a bottle of stem cells that I don't need to go ahead and harvest it from a pet. So it's like reaching for an antibiotic on the shelf. I have that medication right there. Animals have very similar disease patterns with us. They have the same diseases as we do. So when we see how well regenerative medicine is working in these animals, that should give us a lot of hope to be able to use them in humans. I think that stem cell therapy has the potential to be the next penicillin because it's not going to be taking care of a single disease state. It's an approach, it's a medical approach that could be applied to various diseases all the way from diseases such as multiple sclerosis to inflammatory bowel disease and tendon and ligament injury. So very diverse and it has the potential to be that kind of a game changer. And that's it. We can talk with our physician clients about the human disease that is very similar to the animal disease. And from that, we can use our models of naturally occurring disease while helping animals. They can inform the human process for human clinical trials. And so we have a number of examples where we've gone from the animal world, determined what the dose is, what the stem cell is, and that's informed the human clinical trial process. There are people working night and day to develop these cures all over the world, really, developing these novel treatments that are right around the corner. And so for people with diseases that can't be cured right now, I'd say just hang on a little while longer. We are working so hard, we are trying so hard, and we will get there. So new generations of therapeutic products, like monoclonal antibodies, like gene therapy, like stem cells, have a, a natural timeline for development. In the future, I can see somebody going into a hospital, getting tested for their tissue compatibility factors, and then having doctors go into the freezer, pull out a vial of stem cells that matches the tissue of that patient, and then implant those into that patient to be able to repair their tissues. So that, I think, is going to be fabulous. Knowing the research that's being done on cats and dogs and horses, zoo animals, marine animals, what we're learning from them, we can translate into what's been happening for people. So we're helping each other. It's one world, one health, one medicine. Though the human race constitutes just 0.01% of life on the planet, We've managed to destroy 83% of the mammal species who have shared our planet, about half in the last 50 years. Regenerative medicine offers a partial way back from the brink for some species and relief for the ones we love. It's Animal Farm re-envisioned with a PH. Because as Mahatma Gandhi once said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. <laughs>